Hi, I'm Roxy and today we're getting our nerd on and I'm going to show you how to make any kind of brush in Corel Painter. Uh, this is going to be a fairly lengthy tutorial so in the description I'm going to timestamp where I've discussed each brush type in case you need to reference that section again later um, but I do suggest that you watch the whole thing in its entirety at least once because uh, some of the beginning content will apply to later brush types too and I don't want to bore you by repeating myself in, in each section. So before we get started we need to discuss layouts. Um, when you're using a brush in Corel Painter and you want to change something about it you can always uh, pop out the advanced settings tab which has most of the settings that you can play with for that particular brush um, but you'll find it's not comprehensive if you want to see everything that you can do with a brush you're going to have to open all the panels and what you're quickly going to find out is that whomever designed these panels and how they grouped how do I put this <laughs> diplomatically <laughs> let me just say that categorization and UX design uh, is not their primary skill um, the panels are all over the damn show and uh, there isn't one button that you can click that opens uh, them all at the same time so what I've done is I've created this layout which contains all the panels categorized I think a bit better certainly not perfectly but laid out in such a way that they could easily be minimized and maximized as needed so when I'm creating a brush I'm using this layout um, I've found where Painter stores this layout file so I'll include a link to download it in the description with instructions on how to put it into your Painter so if you want to use it and I highly recommend you do uh, this will help a lot when you're making brushes and when you're done creating brushes and you just want to paint you can just toggle it back to your preferred layout so I'm using Corel Painter 2021 hopefully the workspace is backwards compatible let me know if it isn't not that I can do anything about it but just for interest sake um, the other thing you're definitely going to want to do before you start creating brushes is uh, create your own brush category this is so that you don't get your brushes uh, mixed up into the other sets and it's pleasantly simple all you do is you click brushes new brush category and give it a name now if we go to the brush selector we can see our category painter has pre-populated it with a variation of whatever brush you had selected when you created the category you can delete that later but leave it in there for now because you need at least one brush in a category to keep the category so removing the sole remaining brush in the category deletes the whole category so I will start with captured dab brushes if you've made Photoshop brushes before this is like the define brush preset kind of brush if you have no idea what I'm talking about don't worry all we're going to be doing here is making some marks capturing those marks and then using those marks as the bristles of a paintbrush um, the first thing I always do is I grab an existing brush I set the size to 200 and I make a mark on the page uh, this is so that I can make my brush at a similar size I use this as a just to judge the size you can make yours bigger if you like the maximum size is 750 I find 200 is usually more than enough though I paint on really big canvases um, and the only time I need big brushes is for the background most of the time you'll find you'll be detailing the subject itself so the radius of the brush really doesn't need to be that big so when we're designing our bristles we're going to be painting with black white and shades of gray uh, whatever is black will be the most opaque or solid part of the brush you could think of it as the bristles themselves whatever is white is going to be considered as transparent pixels or you could think of it as the gaps in between your brush bristles and the grays will be somewhere in between so when we're ready we draw a selection around the marks and come up here to capture dab but 
painter has a hissy fit when you try and capture a dab on a floating layer see so if you started like this don't worry just click on the layer and press Control e to collapse it to the canvas level now we can go ahead and capture the dab without being shouted at these marks we made will be loaded onto our current brush and we can start experimenting and perfecting it before we actually save it but I'm going to go ahead and save it now just to show you how easy it is we can always update this brush by saving it with the same name so to save the brush go up to brushes click save variant give the brush a name and choose your category and there you have your very own brush like I said you can continue working on it and save over it using the same name if you save it as a different name it's obviously going to create a different brush now uh, this brush we've just saved uh, will have tried to mimic the settings of whatever brush we had selected before we captured the dab including the size of it so if you recall I turned the brush size down to 50 um, and our new brush is saved at a size of 50 if for example before I captured the dab I had an eraser selected and then I clicked capture dab we'd have an eraser brush so of course you can go into the settings after this and stop it from being an eraser or turn it into a blender or whatever um, this is just a way of getting you started in the right direction so if you're creating a bunch of similar brushes that only really differ in dab design this is a huge time saver so bottom line just before you're going to capture a dab save yourself time by selecting an existing brush that has the kind of properties that you want your new brush to have and then you won't have to do too much tinkering afterwards so i'm going to go ahead and do that i'm going to select uh, my square brush at the size that i had it and i'm going to capture the dab again and because uh, we had the brush size at 200 when you created the dab that's the default size of the brush so if we go and change the brush size um, if we click reset it'll go back to 200 so uh, let's go through some of these settings um, <clears throat> firstly you want to look in general the last brush I had when I captured the dab was a single cover soft cover brush so that's what this is too but you can go in here turn it into an eraser or make it a flat with a grainy edge whatever there's a bunch of options in this section alone but for now let's keep it soft cover usually the first thing I always do is I make sure opacity is set to 100 and I set pen pressure to control opacity that means if I press lightly the stroke is going to be semi-transparent and if I press hard the stroke will be opaque directly related to that we have brush calibration and this is something Photoshop needs to be honest it basically allows you to configure the pressure sensitivity this is the range between how light and heavy you want to be able to press your stylus on your tablet because we're all different I have a very light touch so I need the brush to start showing paint at the mere whisper of my stylus and I need to get to full opacity with moderate pressure if you're a person who presses harder you'll calibrate this differently from me if you're using a Wacom tablet you can adjust the pressure sensitivity overall by adjusting the tip feel in the Wacom tablet properties um, if I use this I'd set mine to about here but I prefer to leave this default and use Corel's brush calibration instead because it's more robust and I can set it differently for every brush um, if I'm sketching for example I don't want to have to go over the same line multiple times but if I'm painting I usually want each successive stroke to build up to full opacity so in these situations an overall calibration applied to every brush just doesn't cut it so to get started if you click this icon you'll see this little tick mark apply to current brush variant uh, so this calibration is specifically for this brush uh, so that it can be perfect for you you have a scratch pad here 
where you can start off drawing as light and slow as possible and build up to as hard and fast as you're going to be on your tablet. Um, and this will adjust the numbers for you automatically. Um, I usually just set the numbers because I know what works for me. You'll see two sections here, pressure and velocity. I almost never set any brush to be different based on velocity. So most of the time I ignore these numbers because they won't come into play. Um, so for the pressure, with a painting brush, I'll set the pressure power between 3 and 6. The higher you go, the harder you have to press before you start seeing paint. Um, on sketching brushes, I set this lower. The pressure scale seems to be how hard you have to press to get to full opacity. Um, so pressure power is like the minimum and uh, pressure scale is like the maximum or how quickly you get to maximum. So with painting brushes, I like to set mine to 60% so I don't have to press too hard to get uh, full opacity. If you have a light touch like me, then another happy side effect of proper calibration is you won't be grinding down your nib so fast. The next thing you're going to want to look at is spacing. If you set your brush to above 100%, you're telling it to space out each dab uh, more than the full height or width of the dab, so you start to get gaps like this. Uh, whereas if you set it to 50%, it's half the height of the dab, so you're going to start seeing some overlapping. Continuous time deposition means it'll keep applying the same dab to the same spot while your stylus is pressed down in that spot, like this. It can be awesome for some brushes, which you'll see later, but I'll leave, I'll leave it off for this one. If you're going for a continuous stroke, you're probably going to go for 5% step or less. Word of caution, if you don't have a great PC, a very low step can be taxing on your system. So if you're experiencing lag, a small step is usually the culprit. The performance tab will show you what part of your system the current brush is going to rely on. Some brushes allow you to disable GPU and force your CPU to carry the load. If you're experiencing lag, it's a good idea to check or uncheck this and see how it goes. I had brushes that were lagging with this checked and when I unchecked it, uh, they were smooth as butter. Um, you'll note that I'm clearing the canvas quite quickly. This is a really helpful shortcut for when you're testing out brushes because you're going to be making a lot of marks on the canvas. It's going to get full quickly um, and you don't want to have to keep uh, going over to layers and clearing the layer manually. So uh, all you do is press uh, Control A, Backspace. Control A selects everything, Backspace uh, clears the canvas. So uh, for the angle, I have it uh, set on direction, which means that the angle of the triangle or whatever shape your brush is, um, changes depending on which direction you glide your stylus. If I set it to none, the triangle or whatever dab you painted, is always going to be the right way up. I generally prefer to have mine on direction, but uh, the thing I've noticed is that uh, whichever dab you drew, it sets the, the tip of the brush to the right hand side of the dab instead of the top. So what I do is I put it on direction, but then I set the angle to 270 which chooses the top part of the dab. Uh, now you'll see it's, it's more like a, a how we had it, like an arrow head facing upwards. Whereas at zero degrees, it's using the right hand side of the dab as the vanguard of the brush. So uh, if we go down here to angle step, um, what this does is it constrains the angle to a certain degree. Um, at zero, there's no constraints. The dab can change directions in one degree increments. If I set it to 90 degrees, you'll see it only changes angles in 90 degree increments. If we go up here to jitter, that's where we can randomize the angle. Um, a lot of panels have a jitter option. You can jitter size, opacity, and more. Um, you can see here, the higher we set the jitter, the more the angle is going to randomize. If we go to size, in some situations, you might want the size of your brush to be linked to how hard you press. So, for example, 
if we set the expression to pressure if I press really lightly the brush will be at 1% size whereas if I press firmly it will be at 100% of the current size which is 100 at the moment. The size step is set at 10% meaning it changes sizes in increments of 10%. You can go lower although it really depends on the complexity of the brush. I've had Corel painters shout at me saying I don't have enough memory to complete the operation um, which is absurd because I have 32 gigs of memory. So um, I just leave the step high and increase the minimum size instead. See if we set it to 25% the brush won't go smaller than 25% of 100 so the size difference is a lot more gradual. I usually don't want my brush uh, changing size with pressure though. I guess it depends on the brush but I'll leave it off for this one. On to color variability um, or color abstraction if you prefer. Um, in Photoshop this is called color dynamics. Here you can set a jitter on the hue saturation or value. If you set a jitter on the hue your brush will paint with the chosen color um, but also with the adjacent colors. So if I set a small jitter, say 10%, it's going to use the color I'm on, this blue, uh, some of the cyan from this side of the color wheel and some of the purplish blue from the other side. If I set the jitter to 30%, it widens the range so we might start getting some greens and lilacs. The higher the jitter, the more of a unicorn fart you're going to get so in most cases you're probably limited to around 10% or less. Um, this can be really awesome for foliage. Let's say you pick a mid-range green with 10% jitter. If you paint with that you'll start to get a dappled effect with some more yellowy greens and more bluey greens coming in. Um, it's a lot more natural looking. It's also nice for getting a bit of variation in skin tones. So that was hue. Uh, saturation jitter refers to the range you're going to get between a color and gray. Pure color without any gray means it's completely saturated and pure gray without color is complete desaturation. So before we were working with the circle and now we're working with whatever color you have selected and moving it in a straight line left to gray. This is a lot more subtle so I'll crank it up all the way to 50% so you'll notice it. Finally we have value. Photoshop refers to this as brightness. Um, Corel Painter and the rest of the world call it value. So with saturation uh, where we were working horizontally on the color triangle now we're working diagonally on the triangle. Again I'll crank it up to 50% so you can see. And of course you can use a combination of all three. I just want to set the uh, spacing a bit lower for the next section because um, I need you to see the grain clearly and, and the step of the brush can uh, make it difficult to see. So if we head over to the dab stencil, if you toggle this on and set your source to paper you can choose the texture that you want to appear when the brush is semi-opaque. It's like as if the paper is textured and you've only put a thin layer of paint on so the texture is coming through. So for example if I set it to use this paper and I paint lightly I can see the texture. I hope you can see it on the video. Um, if I paint over it a couple times or press harder the paint becomes opaque and we don't see the texture anymore. Um, except on the edges, uh, unless it's a sharp edged dab in which case the edge will be 100% opacity anyway so you won't see any texture. You can load your own paper textures in here too but I'll do a separate tutorial on that in the near future. I'm going to turn this off for now and show you the other way you can add texture and that's to add grain. Uh, this is grayed out because we selected soft cover under general settings 
but if we change it to one of the grainy options this panel becomes alive and you'll also get this option up at the top here uh, where you'll notice it's also using paper for the grain. Stroke Jitter basically takes your dab and scatters it randomly. There isn't as much control over this as Photoshop has because in Photoshop you can choose the scattering to be X or Y based and in the shape dynamic you can also choose X and Y to randomly flip. I haven't figured out how to do that in Corel Painter but you can still have fun with this. This is a pine brush I made. You can see I've set the stroke jitter to 1. Now I see I'm holding down shift to draw a straight line and yet the line is scattering. If I increase the jitter to 4 it scatters even more. So I found for this particular brush 1 is sufficient. Um, and then also I set the spacing to 100% so that the dabs don't overlap too much and I turned off the direction expression because we want the dabs to face the right way the whole time instead of uh, following the direction of the stylus and I set the size to gradually increase with pressure um, and the same with the opacity so all this together allows me to press gently for pines in the distance and press harder for closer pines. If I were to turn off the stroke jitter, you see how everything is just too neat. So that's the purpose of stroke jitter. So for the next thing I'm going to show you, we need a small brush. So just going to quickly draw a little dot and capture it. If we go back to the general tab, but two steps back, we can change single to rake. And this takes your dab and turns it into the tines of a rake. Um, at first you probably won't see the effect because there's some changes we need to make. In the rake settings we turn up the contact angle and also the brush scale. If you soften the bristle edge then if you press lightly you'll only see one tine and if you press harder then more tines will make contact with the surface. You can also increase and decrease the number of tines, so this is one way of creating a hatching brush. So uh, let's have a look at the blending now. You can turn almost any brush into a blender or a partial blender. So I'm going to take this wedge brush that we made earlier and show you how to turn it into a blender. I'm just going to grab some colors to play with. If we come down here to the, uh, the blending panel, the first thing that I want to point out is always, always, always uh, tick enhanced layer blending. If you don't have that ticked, um, your brush can sometimes have like a white edges when you're painting on different layers. It's really unsightly. So uh, even with brushes that aren't blender brushes, always tick that. Um, but back to the actual blending itself. The other thing you'll notice uh, in the panel is this uh, bunch of presets here. You can basically ignore these because uh, we're going to go ahead and um, make the blender how we want it to be. We don't need to uh, select a template for it. Um, so basically uh, what controls how blendy a brush is, is the ratio between resaturation and bleed. Resaturation deals with the amount of paint that's on your brush at the time. So basically whatever color is specified in the color wheel. We have ours set to 100%. So we have 100% of that blue on the brush right now. So if we paint, it doesn't matter how hard or soft we paint, we're going to get blue and no blending. Bleed deals with what's already on the canvas and how much of it is going to get onto your brush when you drag your brush over that spot. We have our set to zero, so right now we won't have any bleeding going on. If I turn resaturation down to zero, meaning I have no color on the brush, and I turn bleed up to 100%, then the brush is going to act as a pure smudger. So wherever I paint, it's going to use those underlying colors and smudge them around without using any of the blue color that we have selected on the color wheel. And because there's no expression chosen, it's going to do 100% smear all the time. If I set the expression to pressure, then if you press lightly, you'll get partial blending. And if you press hard, you'll get 100% smear. 
That's hard. That's soft. Now here's where it gets interesting. If I increase the resaturation and set it to pressure and change the bleed expression to reverse pressure, now we have a brush that has paint on it, but that's also going to smear. The harder we press, the more of the brush color we're going to get. The softer we press, the more it's going to smear. So in Photoshop, where you have to select a separate blending brush to start blending, here it's all in the same brush. If you want, you obviously can have full separate blending brushes, but uh, if you're doing a lot of painting and blending work, this is uh, a really nice time saver. I'm going to come back to this panel a little bit later when we talk about particle brushes because I want to show you something awesome. Uh, but first, let's talk about stroke attributes, um, which is basically setting your strokes to use a merge mode. Like Photoshop, you can paint on a separate layer using a layer style, for example, screen like this. But if you don't want to use separate layers and you want a blend mode applied to the paint instead, this is where you use stroke attributes. Uh, glazing has similar stuff going on, but you need to actually make your dab a glazing brush, like so. Uh, like stroke attributes, you have to use it on the same layer to get the merge effects to work. Something else you're probably going to want to play with um, is hard media. Um, it seems to be the settings for creating brushes that look different when tilted. Unfortunately, I can't show you that because my Wacom Intuos is just a normal one, not the Pro, so it doesn't support tilt. Well, that brings us to a close of part one. Thanks for watching. Uh, I'll be back in part two discussing airbrushes and bristle brushes. Much obliged if you leave a like and subscribe.